Okay, welcome. This is so exciting. Jennifer, I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, we are live streaming to LinkedIn and to YouTube at the same time. So hopefully no more technical glitches. Um, so this will be kind of fun. This is the very first Lessons from the Leaderboard to Leadership. <laughs> and um, I have Jennifer Giovinazzo. Did I say that right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, I said it wrong last week and I went, oh no. <laughs> um, Jennifer and I were introduced through one of the real estate agents on her team, actually, who was like, hey, here's Rebecca's book. Maybe she should come talk to our team. I was trying to remember, Jennifer, like how we met and that's um, that's how we met. That's and exactly um, we've kept in touch. Jennifer has attended my uh, one of my executive roundtables. And um, what we really focus on at Rise Up Consulting are emerging sales leaders and especially helping people transition from the sales leaderboard to leadership um, and what that does for everyone. And through the conversation with my corporate clients and sales leaders the past couple of years, there is a, it, it really hurts. That transition hurts and there's not a ton of support there. Um, for anyone who's watching, I had done a um, survey back in March of 2021 of, of the research of how much training's done and the biggest problem. So if people want to get that from me, they can reach out to me. Um, but I wanted Jennifer to come on and just talk about, you know, her transition and what's, what, what she's figured out and some of the things that she wished she would have known um, back when she was a, a new leader. So I'm so excited to have you here, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. I'm super excited to be here too. And I, you know, I'm, I'm informally trained. So I think again, I, some of my experience will probably resonate with a lot of maybe the people that are watching or going to be watching because I'm kind of OJT on the job training. And so because of that, I, I just, I mean, it's kind of just what I know. And so, and like today, anybody who wasn't on here or when we got on here, we already had 10 minutes of computer glitches. Well, sometimes when you're in sales, that's your typical day. So you, you just got to get up and do it. Yeah. You just got to get up and do it. Absolutely. Yeah. You do. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You do. So, um, well, I'm excited. So can you um, give your background because you've had so much success as a real estate agent, but do you want to just kind of give your, your background, uh, where you are right now, where people can find you? Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. So my name is Jennifer Giovinazzo. I'm an actually licensed, um, actively, um, real estate agent, but I'm also the general manager of 47 agents for the Pinnacle team, um, currently kind of housed out of our White Bear Lake office. But if you Google the Pinnacle team or my name, we will pop up in, in a lot of places. Um, we have been in business since 2016. And, um, you know, started out with a couple of agents and then has, we have now grown to 47. We hope our goal by the end of the year is to have 75 um, sales agents, but it's not just about the amount. It's really about the quality, which I think we'll kind of talk a little bit in our discussion here today of the, who you hire or what makes, makes you want to stand out to hire that one particular person. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, you've had so much success. Um, and so we're going to back it up a few years, though. So I want everyone because this is people always go like, how did you get into sales leadership? Why did you not just want to stay selling? You actually do both. You are a mm -hmm. selling sales leader, a producing sales leader, which is right. the forgotten middle child of the sales world. It's one of the <laughs> yeah. most difficult, I think, the most difficult things to do truly yeah. is balancing a book of business mm -hmm. and balancing a team. Um, but what were some of your biggest strengths as a salesperson? What kind of set you up to get into sales? Leader? Um, you know what? One of probably the biggest thing is I am not a procrastinator. So I kind of tackle, I kind of try to jump in there whenever I can. So I'm not a procrastinator. I think that is a biggie for a lot of people. And I, and I watch and learn. So I, my success has been 
it started really, so I'll give you a little bit of background. I went to a, a year of college, decided college wasn't going to be for me. I was going to be an occupational therapist. They wore uniforms. I had to work with, I mean, small motor skills. It just, after a year, I said to my folks, I said, this is not going to work. And they said, well, you need to go out and get a job. So I went out and got a job. And my first real job or career job was with Best Buy Company. So I started out as a cashier. I was 18, 19 years of age. And I quickly rose up from, in fact, the guy who we're still friends today, he's like, I almost didn't hire you because you had kind of this strange Mohawk hairdo. And, at, you know, so I was like, you know, again, looking and listening to what everybody told me, I adapted. And so I started watching and learning. And I have to give Best Buy a lot of credit. They had an amazing training staff that helped and recognized people who maybe had the right stuff to get into sales or get into management. And what I did was I, I followed the book to a T. I figured success leaves clues. I did exactly what they told me to do with my own spin, my personality, because I don't want anybody to be anybody but who they are. And my career took off from there. So by 21 or 22 years of age, I was running a Best Buy store, which had never been done by a woman or anyone as young as me. So I give them a tremendous amount of credit. And that was really the start. Yeah. But I remember as a young child, you know, doing a sales job on my mom to allow me to have a, you know, a, a rabbit for Easter. And eventually, if you ask enough times, you just might get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My children have learned that. Well, they're really, exactly. they're like, but that's sales mom. And I go, yeah. don't use my own words on me. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting. So you had a Best Buy start. So Best Buy is obviously a very large corporation and um, there's a lot of sales leaders who don't have, I work with a lot of small to mid-sized sales mm -hmm. companies. So you said that I followed the book. Did they yep. have an actual book? Did they have a playbook for you? Did they have yeah. like a sales playbook? Because that's something that I help my clients with because they're like, we don't have one of those. Yeah. But now, yeah. So back, this is like 1985. So a long, long time ago, they were a very small company. They were just expanding into other states. They literally had a three ring binder and on the front, it had a Best Buy, you know, logo and my name, if I remember correctly. And inside of it was these four or five, six, seven, 10 pages, a little bit about the company, setting up the sale, how to ask for the sale, you know, some of the additional products that you could sell were all right in there. And I just learned to follow what, again, someone told me to do. And because of that, I learned real quickly that you know, and I, I agree that pioneering your own path can be very, can be also very rewarding and very successful. But at that point in my life, it was, it was doing what others had set forth for me and it worked. Why would yeah. they give me any playbook that wasn't going to work? Yeah. So it didn't make any yeah. sense to deviate. Yeah. yeah. So another question I have, another follow-up question with what you said, because you had a, a sales leader who saw in you, you know, he made you the first female store manager what did he say what he saw in you like what do you think he saw in you as strengths that would make you great potential because that's a huge question that emerging people who want to get into sales leadership are like do i have i know i'm good at sales do i have what it takes to be a sales leader and then sales executives are always asking what makes a great sales leader here like what could mm -hmm. we pick out what do you think he saw in you besides the fact you were good at sales you were coachable and you worked really hard yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing is that all of that right there was I had a lot of energy. I was willing to learn. So I was, a, I was, I carried the flag, you know, I, I, I made them proud. I carried the flag, hardworking, uh, willing to learn and um, probably also just integrity, you know, how you show up every day. Um, I think you know, makes, makes a leader as well when no matter what type of leadership you're in, I think just that integrity of what you do every day, those were probably the biggest things. Yep. Yeah. Those, the, the values that you, you um, want to make sure the leader has so that the whole sales team has that because so goes the leader, right? So goes the team. Yeah. Now I know when I transitioned from being just a sale, uh, just a real estate agent, I don't mean just in the sense of any, it's just, but just doing that to going into general managing and sales managing. So many people in the industry said those who manage are those that can't sell. 
that was the kind of the feedback that I received is those that get into management because they can't do the sales. I, I beg to differ. Our whole sales management team, which is pretty extensive in at the Pinnacle team, um, our owners still sell. I still sell all of our directors, which are I consider kind of our real manage, middle management uh, boots on the ground. They all sell and not a small amount. They're all industry top salespeople. So we kind of have a little bit different philosophy in regards to that. I think what it helps is we understand there's empathy in when you are now dealing with your staff. Um, or you're out boots on the ground, there's a certain empathy and knowledge you get that you wouldn't have by sitting in a desk. Nothing good happens sitting at a desk. You need to do it, but really you got to be out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. There is a thing like those who can't do teach. And I know us consultants get like a, a bad rap for that sometimes. Like, well, if you're so good at that, why aren't you doing it? anymore but you have to and this is what that's actually a really great point of what you just made i think it's very difficult for someone to come into a sales leadership position that has never sold because oh. you don't know what it's like to get all those no's and to and to beat your head against the wall and just deal with it right it's very hard to do absolutely i think i i rely on my own experience mostly failures what didn't work to share with the team all of the time. And I think, again, it comes from a place that has some validity because no, no one is succeeding all of the time, but there's a solution to every problem. So every failure you have, you just got to figure out how to do it better. That's all, you, you know, or you can quit. But yes, I can't imagine trying to run a sales team with no sales background. It's I really tough. would have a tough time running a sales team with no, without being somewhat boots on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are, um, it, it depends on your industry right. of what you're doing, but you're right. Some people prefer there. Mm -hmm. um, I did, and I forget what the the stats were because I did that survey a long time ago, but of the sales managers, there were a percentage of them that never wanted to give up their book of business. They wanted sure. to sell and lead. I was the type of salesperson. I was like, what do I have to do so I can stop selling? Mm -hmm. Like literally was my thing. I was like, I always wanted to be a leader. Yeah. That's why I wanted to 100% of my time spent in that. So it's funny. It's kind of like preference, skill set, uh, right? But um, industry like maybe. you love yeah. it. They would never yeah. give up selling. Well, and maybe I'm just saying, hey, look at look at this way of life because it's what I do every day, right? Would there be an opportunity someday that I maybe don't want to sell? And could I still manage a sales team? I believe I believe so by far. But will I need a different skill set? I would. It, that would be that next level of skill set, I believe. Mm -hmm. And there are there. Um, we won't get into that today, but there are different skill sets at every. I call it like a new role, you know, new promotion, new role, new rules, new yeah. skill sets. And it is. It's like um, different as we go up in the in the pipeline. What got you here won't get you there. But people don't actually sit and go, OK, what are actually the skills I need now? Mm hmm to keep moving forward. What worked for me that won't work anymore? You know, mm -hmm. that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, did you know you always wanted to be a sales leader? No. Okay. No, no, actually I, you know, again, I, I, when I was a little girl, I thought I'd be a fireman or a veterinarian. And then of course, when it was, you know, push came to shove, what do you want to do with your life? So I went to a year of college as an occupational therapist, not at all what would be in my realm now knowing today. So I just went to work. And I think one of the things that I have learned to be really good at, whether it's personally or professionally, is when a door opens up, even if it's just a little bit, I walk through there. I kind of see that as being, that's my path I'm supposed to take, whether I was the one who created it, that opening or not. And usually we usually, we are, we just don't know what cause and effect it is, but it can be just how you show up every day. And so this is how it's taken me where it's going to go. And now I've had an opportunity to do things like be on your, on your, talk here today. I've been on a few podcasts. I think my doors are continuing to open up just because of some of those things, which I really don't know where it's all going to end up, but yeah, but sales yeah. has always been the force behind it. Yep. No, showing up is so, so important where, you know, there might be conditions that aren't perfect, but you just have to show 
up. You know, oh, yeah. like today we had some technical difficulties and two other women or two other people might have been like, we'll just reschedule. But yeah. You show up imperfect or not. Right. Yeah. There's no such thing. I don't think there's anything as perfect. And, yeah. and I don't think you don't you don't wait either. You're I'm an activator. That's one of my top five strength finders. I'm guessing that's yours too, because you just mm -hmm. move. Like, yeah. what's the minimum we need to do for motion to get some momentum going? Like, just Correct. keep showing up. And, and and they do. Doors do open. Doors do open. There's an old saying that says you, you um, dress for not the job you have, but the job you want, right? Now, if you're like me, never really knowing where you were going to end up in, in all of it is you just show you, you act, think and say, and do not for the level that you're at, but always trying to just raise that level. And you want to, when you decide, you know, again, who's going to be on your sales team, or you want to see, sometimes it's not the education. Sometimes it's not even the experience. It's going to be, what's the heart of that human, because those are the people that will accelerate in the certainly in the right environment. Yeah. I yeah. love that. The heart of the human. Yeah. The heart of the human. Yeah. I'm a big alliteration person. Everything I do is like an alliteration. So I love that. The heart yeah. of the human. Um, can you remember? So think back to your learning curve as um, as a sales leader, um, either it could be in real estate or you could be taking us back to your very first experience with Best Buy. But what were some of the mistakes you remember making? Because you said your thing is like trial and error. You are like learning on the job. Um, so kind of take us through that because it's sticky. And I what I feel like we set people up to fail because we don't give them the proper training. There's going to be mistakes. You can't out train mistakes. They're still going to happen. Correct. Um, but 80% of sales leaders told me they got zero training once they got promoted. Mm -hmm. And the Harvard Business Review says that it's about a 12 year, like the average age someone gets their first leadership promotion is age 30, but they're not trained formally until age 42. So wow. this is across the board. So that, and I, my goal is to kind of minimize that and, you know, obviously, but, but talk through some of your common mistakes. Cause I feel like salespeople, they have a tiny window as a new leader, they either fail and go back to sales and say, this isn't for me. And I think we lose so many great sale, possible sales leaders, mm -hmm. or you just go, this is my mistake. I hope to never make that again. And I hope I can prevent someone else from making that. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, I think is, you know, set the goal of, if you do not have a training, a form, you know, some kind of formal structure or foundation for training, build one, set a goal and get one done in 90, 120, you know, 160 days. Because again, and you can, you can kind of build it together, even with your team that doesn't have one. But when I first got into the, in the business, this famous book was out, was called the one minute manager. And it was like this crazy, you know, cultural book for managers. And I read it and I read it and I read it. And my relationships were one minute long. That's not a relationship. And, on, you know, we've evolved since then, since the 80s again. And at the time that seemed to have worked or maybe it was, you know, trying to change again an old management way of doing business. So it was a great book. But I realize relationships take a lot there are a lot more. So if you're going to be a sales leader, knowing what it is that makes your team want to get up every day is really important. Everybody's going to say money, but I would, and I think you even coach on this, Rebecca, is it's not really the money. It's what does the money bring to you? Is it security? Is it a new car? Is it a college education for the kids? Whatever it may be, that's the that's the conversation then or the reminder when you don't want to get up and go to work today or not me, but, you know, maybe someone on your sales team is, does this get you closer to that college education for your kids? Does the, your choices, is it getting you where you want to go? And you and I talked on the last um, time when we had our your leadership roundtable we use words like you, here's how we manage our kids. You need to go to college. You need to save your money. You need to get a job. Well, that motherhood and fatherhood instinct can sometimes be brought into the workplace. And we tell our employees, you need to make five phone calls. You need to do this. You need to be early. And framing the question a little bit different gets you a lot 
abstraction dealing with an adult to an adult. And that has been really, truly a game changer going from a salesperson to, and actually even a more successful salesperson to now a sales manager. Yeah. 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 Yeah, We can talk about the metrics people need to succeed and around their motivation all day long, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's, um, and I believe that the sales world relies too heavily on extrinsic motivation because the most successful people got this desire and they are rooted in what they are working for, whether it be excellence or their legacy, they're thinking bigger picture, they're thinking yep. bigger impact. And yep. um, it just, it takes time to think mm-hmm. about that. Like you have yep. to take the time to slow down to get really rooted and then success takes off because you're just, you can just sense it in people when they're just something oozing from them or they, they've got it, they know what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. And that breeds more sales and people want to do business with successful salespeople. Yeah. Yeah. It, I've been through a, a um, start with the end in mind. So what do you, they, to the point of even being morbid is what do you want on your gravestone? What will be written there? You just touched on it, the word legacy, right? Is there something that you want to leave behind? Or let's just say your legacy is from the time when you stop working and you retire. What does that legacy for your next life look like? Now, I will never disregard metrics. Very, very hard to change something you do not monitor or don't know. So some kind of system or structure to have in place, not only for yourself, but for your team to kind of wrap their brain around where you want to go. We have a goal of of 500 transactions this year, which is 100 more than we did last year. And right now we're, we're kind of on track to be a little bit shy of where we started. It doesn't change our goal, though. What it does is it change how the efforts we put behind it at this point, right? Second quarter is what the efforts look like um, behind it, because, you know, it's going to be a long nine months if we we already slow down our goal. Yeah. Yeah. People that change the um, they'll keep the work effort the same. Like they're like, I'm committed to work this hard. Well, that's actually what you're committed to. You're committed to the up, the end result. That's how you get paid in sales, right? You get it's results business and you do have to change sometimes, especially with real estate, I mean, there, everything changes. Everybody's got disruption and there's extenuating circumstances, but the sales leaders like you who know you're, you're keeping track of where you are, you're keeping track of what's going on. And you'll say, here's how we get smarter. Here's how we work harder. Here's how, here's how we still keep the goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and if this is all we have, right, as far as manpower or resources, then you got to start looking outside. And those, in, in a lot of cases, those answers, if you spend a little bit of time just taking a look at where you are, those answers kind of come. I, I mean, I have found that they, if you seek them out, they, they'll they find their way in there. Now, sometimes it's being around people who are smarter than you, which is why I'm hanging out with you, Rebecca, just so you know. So that, you know, because they're going to raise that bar. You never really want to just hang out with people who are comfortable, right? Right. Um, that's not a good word. You want to be always finding someone because our world is changing. I have this feeling that if we're standing still, even if it's a great place, the rest of the world is going up, you know, is moving on and we're yep. missing the bus. Yep. Yeah. I always recommend people to audit their, their friend circles and their professional circles. Mine have changed. Mine have changed a ton. I, you know, when COVID hit and there were some people who, um, didn't handle it the way I thought they should handle it. Right. And I went, I still love them and I still care for them, but that's not going to be who I intentionally hang around moving forward professionally. Right. Like it's, and I'm sure that's exactly what you're talking about. Getting around good people. Absolutely. Yeah. I I agree. Yep. So I think all of this, not one, there's never just one answer to it all. Um, There, you know, there's always multiple answers to it. There are, there totally are. Yeah. Um, what do you think your biggest strength as a sales leader is? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. My enthusiasm for the job. My my literally my enthusiasm to watch others succeed by far. Yep. And yep. I'm sure your team can sense that. Yeah, I I well, I certainly hope so. But yes, they I they can. They see me out there every day taking risks beyond anything I ever imagined doing. So when I ask them to do the same thing, 
They, they are a lot more willing to go do that. There isn't anything I wouldn't. And again, we're, we've kind of got, we were a really tight knit group. So they, I, as you know, um, it might feel a little, we're not corporatized. So we have this different kind of feel is we literally will go the distance for each other. And that I think makes a big difference. Now the, always the hard part is leading by example. I remember when my my dad, he worked six days a week, he owned his own company. I watched and learned and it was just normal to work 50 hours a week, right? It was just normal. So my um, ex-husband and I had really strong work ethics as well, but our children being millennials, nothing against them, but they didn't learn by example the same way that I learned from example, different generation. So as much as you want your team to learn by example, right? You really have to have systems and structures and monitoring in place because they have to actually see more than just how hard you work, mm -hmm. right? Or how successful you might be. So um, it, that has been a big learning curve. Sometimes I think I rely too much on my instincts. And so I have to learn to get a little bit more less gray and a little more black and white on, again, those metrics. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's so true. I, the old school, I was always taught to hard work will pay off. Just work really hard and it'll pay off. And it has. Um, but what I turn that to be is that it has to be hard. Yeah. And work doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to, like I thought, if I'm not beating my head against into a wall, if I'm not getting 30 no's a day, I just don't deserve success. And the the newer generations, millennials and Gen Z, they don't want that. They do not want that. They don't want it easy, but they, they want different things and the way that they look at work changes. And so what you were just saying, like you want to be an example um, and, and all leaders should want to be examples, but you can't be the only example because um, your strengths are different. What you're willing to do is what theirs. So we coach to strengths. Mm -hmm. And I totally disagree with what you just said. You should rely less on your instincts. You should rely more on your instincts. Um, people should rely more on their instincts, but where, where, your, where your instinctual strengths lack, that's where you rely on your team mm -hmm. to help you. Um, yeah. And it's funny because I asked, this, this is like a rolling question, this conversation with this little pit bit we're in now, because I asked you what your strengths are. And people have a hard time talking about their strengths. We can talk about our successes. We can talk about what we've accomplished because we've worked hard. But if but if you do zone in on your instinctual strengths and you zone in on this, because that's where that's where you get the gap. If you go all in, you get more training and more knowledge, and you just lean into those. That's your that's your slight edge. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But if you sure. only rely on instinct and avoid where you're weak. You know, have somebody else do that. You can't avoid yeah, it. But. <laughs> exactly. And I want to touch on a little bit something where you talked about, hey, 30 phone calls, you get your nose, you get your nose. Guess what? The consumer doesn't want that either anymore. So if we can come from a place of value in our head and in our hearts for what the consumer may need or want from us, instead of the old traditional, again, one minute manager type sales, right? or the robo dialer type sales, nothing against those. I know people are using them and they're effective and, and that's their business model. But for real estate and I think for just people's, again, so their heart and soul stays in their goal setting is the whys in the house. And that's based on what the consumer is looking for or needing or wanting from us. Right. So it, I think sales has and you've probably seen it. You I mean, you've been in it for a long time. You know, the way we approach the consumer or our marketplace is much different than it used to be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Much, much more. Different. Uh, yes. I find that all the time. If people can figure out what is the value you can add, this is a value add. Right. You and I are just sharing some value with emerging sales leaders or people who are trying to build large real estate teams or whatever, whatever background they're in. And, um, but you have to, it's, it's all about you. It's all about being, um, being valuable. And, and if people find you valuable, they will reach out to you or when you, we, we reach out to them. Cause I know you make calls and I make calls, but when you reach out, if you've been providing value, they will respond and it Correct. works the same way in sales as it does in sales leadership. Correct. It does. It's, it applies in both. And that's part of that when you are, 
having conversations with your teammates or your sales staff, it's the same thing as what is the value that we get to bring each other? Because I believe relationships are a two-way street, not one way down. It's you know one way up as well. So a two-way street. So part of their requirements in a relationship is you got to come with something. Not all the time, but once in a while, you got to come with something. But then they get to be part of the change or the win or the success or whatever it may be. And that is why people stay, right? That's why people will work harder. Pay is like third on the scale. I think it's part of a community, affect their outcome or their change, and then pay. So these two are just as important when you're in sales, more yeah. so probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, um, I mean, if you just like, you can Google Gallup <laughs> and organizational development, you can, there's all these, they've been studying this for years and years, but the thing that people want now when they're looking and in and, and sales and across the board um, is they want, they're looking for a place where they're going to be developed. They're going to get personal and professional development. There's a path for um, promotion. If they don't get it at work, they will leave. They will right. leave. Yeah. And so you're absolutely right. So I think that the money and sales might be might be higher, might be two, but it's not number one. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. It's not number one. Mm -hmm. Someone's not going to go get a sales job where the pay is terrible, but mm -hmm. that's, it's not, we are, this is not, you know, baby boomer generation where they would just put their heads down and make money for their family. That is not... Yeah. That's what people are looking for. Yeah. Well, 100% sales commission job, the pay is pretty terrible until you get going. So, <laughs> yeah, we could talk about that too. I'm going to go with that. Well, as we wrap up here, what advice would you give for emerging sales leaders or top salespeople who are looking to get into sales leadership? What What's some advice that you would you would bring give them? Um, what I would do is set small, you know, first of all, set small goals. Um, be mindful of who you hire. Don't just fill with a warm body. Be mindful of who you hire. Um, do the hard work first. So always your biggest challenge of the day, do that one first and foremost, get it off your plate so you can have clear head when you're either dealing with your challenges or having those conversations. Be honest with yourself and others. You know, no one expects me to have all of the answers. I never want to be the person that has all of the answers. So it's okay to not have all of them. Um, and then before you give up on anything, if you really believe in something, give it six months, give it a fair chance to prove you wrong instead of quitting after six days or six weeks, give it six months. If you, if you believe in something and then number one, eliminate distractions. However, you eliminate distractions to your people and yourself, right? Whether you, we lock ourselves in a room, however that may be, but eliminate distractions because when you get distracted, it, it takes 15 to 20 minutes to get back on task. And when it comes right down to it, our work, work, our work day is really probably a half of what we should be spending our time on instead of trying to find our feet again from a distraction. Yep. I love that advice of that. Um, <laughs> it's so it's so true. Yeah. Distractions that, that could be a whole session in itself, yeah. right? That could be a whole session. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I guess I, I would say you joining. Yeah. Oh, you bet. Oh, I was just going to no, no, say, no. trust yourself. You, you got the job for a reason. Just trust that you are in the right place for the right reason. That door opened up. So take it um, and then just do the very best that you can. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's for such great advice. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Jennifer, for joining me this morning. Um, I've loved our conversation. I will in the the notes, I will put where people can um can reach you. And um, but I just so thankful and it's so inspiring to listen to your story and how hard you've worked and all the success that you're having. And I, I wish you continued success. Thank you. And likewise to you too as well. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. All right. Have a great day. You too.